Hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to you because we know people are joining us from different parts of the world. Uh, my name is Prateep Nayak. I am part of the V2B Global Partnership for Building Strong Small Scale Fisheries. I'm based in the University of Waterloo in Canada. Um, welcome to you all. Uh, I'm going to start uh, uh, with a few rounds of introduction. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, the B2B Global Partnership and also provide a brief uh, overview of the thematic webinar for which we are here and also introduce our speaker today uh, before we get uh, to uh, listen uh, to the talk uh, by our speaker. So uh, a bit of introduction to the B2B Global Partnership, you know, which is a transdisciplinary research, knowledge, and action network with over 100 members from Africa, Asia, Canada, and internationally. The goal of the Global Partnership is, is to support small-scale fisheries in their transition from vulnerability to viability. And the way we focus on vulnerability and viability is not just in an economic sense, but also in a way that represents all aspects of Fisher's life and includes the political, cultural, environmental, ecological, and social and other aspects of their lives. In doing our work as part of the uh, partnership, we focus on four things. One is the co-production and co-creation of the knowledge that is essential for uh, vulnerability and viability understanding and work creating a repository or a database uh, or information system of that uh, co-produced knowledge, developing multifaceted capacity and capacities are across multiple layers uh, from community to the government and uh, everything in between, uh, which facilitate uh, the transition from vulnerability to viability. The fourth is a focus on synthesis and integration of the co-produced knowledge in ways that it can inform the policy and practice and theory of uh, vulnerability viability transitions. And of course, you know, a larger part of our work uh, engages us in knowledge mobilization across multiple layers. The B2B Global Partnership aims to identify the diverse factors and conditions contributing to the vulnerability of small scale fisheries and engage collaboratively with small-scale fisher communities and other key NGO, government, and university partners to enhance small-scale fisheries viability. We are conducting transdisciplinary, community-engaged uh, research in six countries of Asia. That includes Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, and six countries in Africa. That includes Ghana, Malawi, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania. In doing so, the B2B uh, Global Partnership brings people and organizations and institutions together across physical, cultural, disciplinary boundaries through a shared interest in addressing global change impacts on small-scale fisheries. The B2B thematic webinar series for which we all have gathered online here is an initiative of the B2B Global Partnership to facilitate and generate high-level discussions on vulnerability and viability themes and topics within the context of small-scale fisheries. The goal is to feature academics, government representatives, practitioners, and members of the civil society who have made significant contributions to the theoretical, practical, and policy aspects of small-scale fisheries, both locally and globally. The B2B thematic webinar series takes place on the last Friday of every month. Um, and it will continue to be so during the uh, year 2024. So you are invited all to join us on the last Friday of every month uh, for this uh, thematic webinar series. The series is available internationally through live streaming on YouTube. Details regarding the monthly webinars can be found uh, on our website, which is www.b2bglobalpartnership.org. Today's webinar is the third in the series of web B2B thematic webinars planned for the year 2023, uh, 2024, I'm sorry, and the 39th since January 2021 when we started this series. And it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Kafayat Adeton. Pakoya as our distinguished speaker today. 
Dr. Kafayat Fakaria is a uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Fisheries in Lagos State University currently. She was born in Germany and raised in Lagos, Southwest Nigeria, where she completed her studies. She is an interdisciplinary researcher, and consult a consultant and an academic. She holds a Bachelor uh, of Science in Fisheries from Lagos State University in Nigeria, a Master's of Science in Fisheries Management from University of Ibadan, and a PhD in fisheries biology from Lagos State University. You can see the expertise in terms of her training in uh, fisheries science and management uh, across uh, all her degrees. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fakoya's Fako research focuses on gender, local ecological knowledge, food and nutrition security, aquaculture, small scale fisheries, uh, uh, fisheries assessment, and seafood sustainability uh, schemes. Dr. Fakoya was a case study author and the gender advisor in the Illuminating Hidden Harvest, the large study that uh, was completed in 2022 and the report uh, Illuminating Hidden Harvest was published by Duke, Duke University and FAO. Uh, she was the lead uh, in, in, for Nigeria, small scale fisheries and laid a gender design in science, technology, engineering and uh, arts and, and mathematics, uh, which is STEM. In addition, she is a member of several professional networks, including the Gender in Aquaculture and Fisheries section, Community Catch, Mundus Maris, and Too Big to Ignore. I'm also very proud to say that you know, Dr. Fakua is a co-investigator of V2B Global Partnership and currently a V2B uh, country coordinator in Nigeria. So it is my honor to invite Dr. Kafayat Adeton Fakoya to deliver today's talk for the V2B thematic webinar series 2024. The title of uh, the talk is Shellfish uh, Fisheries as a Tool for Stewardship and uh, Conservation of Mangroves. So thank you very much, Dr. Fakoya, for making the time. So over to you for your talk, please. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Kafayat Fakoya uh, from the Lagos State University. So, and I welcome you to this webinar, and I hope you would like the topic. It's mainly focused on women, and um, with the hope that it will make a difference. So, I'm sharing my screen. Um, the topic as a uh, uh, Pratip said is shell fisheries as a tool for the stewardship and conservation of mangroves. Now, um, I'll go straight to the introduction, which is to highlight the significance of mangroves. Uh, this, despite covering um, about three to five percent of the total global forest area, mangroves are disproportionately important in terms of the services. These, these are the ecosystem services, and, in, and these include provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services. Now, um, according to a study by Bimram et al., 2022, mangroves ecosystem services contribute to 13 sustainable development goals, while recent studies have only reported um, localized implementation of three of these sustainable development goals. Mangroves have traditionally supplied indigenous coastal communities with fertile fishing grounds, wood for construction, timber, honey, fibers, dyes, tannins, and medicines. This is according to Crow and Canet 2013. And I'm sure that there are also a plethora of uh, local studies elsewhere that have reported the many uh, services that are provided by mangroves. Now, I want to highlight just about uh, four of these um, ecosystem services. Um, now in the global carbon cycle, mangroves, the capacity, storage capacity of mangrove is about 6.4 billion ton of tons, and which is about two to four times more than the global rate of terrestrial forests. I'm sorry to interrupt, you know, can you do the slide so please? Uh... Are you, it's moving. 
the migration okay. capacity of kelps, forests, and the likes have not been evaluated, and that does not what we can say can contribute, can yet said to be contributing to uh, the mitigation of climate change. Now, this here is a slide showing the ecosystem services provided by mangroves. Uh, you can see that it is for provisioning in terms of fisheries, in terms of uh, timber wood, fuel wood, in terms of tanning dyes, in terms of so many other things like medicine. It's also very important in terms of coastal protection, uh, water filtration. Then, of course, you have the cultural values, which includes tourism, recreation, uh, um, uh, for as well as for um, spiritual purposes and the likes. So there are many services of um, provided by mangroves, which are been quantified by so many uh, researchers. And uh, but then the there's still some issues with the economic and social valuation of the mangroves to actually know their worth and make case for their uh, conservation and um, management. But in large countries like Nigeria, inclusive, um, the stored equivalent of more than one percent of national most of fossil fuels is uh, is uh, from is, is uh, by the mangroves. Now I said that uh, mangroves are very essential as fish factories and essential nursery habitats. In Australia, for instance, the mangroves con contribute to the commercial fisheries to the tune of about um, 3.5 million Aus million Australian dollars per year. And then, but they are more important in the global south when you con consider how the 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 um the as assessment of the contributions to nature fisheries both within the mangroves and adjacent to the mangroves where you have fisheries that are substantially small subsistence as it, as it artisanal and small scale now as uh, coastal defenders they are important to for control of erosion to prevent flood and also to prevent storm protect and to prevent from storm and then of cultural services I'd mentioned before. Now, however, there are uh, there are data that are needed to assess mangrove use and- I'm sorry plants. to interrupt, uh, uh, Kafayat, you know, so your slide is not moving on um, on our end. So oh, can you reshare it please? And then uh, uh, also do the slide so more. Okay. Okay, and share the slide again. Yeah, I'm going to do that. And do the slides, uh, uh, slide so. So let's see, is it moving? No, do the slide so. I've done that. It's not doing slides so actually. I don't know what it is. Um, like you. Okay. Okay. What about now? No. You can do from current slide or something. Over now. Or you can you can can you send us uh send the slide to Maha so she can share it for you. Yes. I think okay. there is some problem which uh, due to which it mm. is not working. You can send it uh, through okay. uh, Zoom uh, chat also. Okay. We are really sorry for this uh, you know technical problem here. Give us a few minutes. We'll start again. Okay.
Okay. Um, uh, I've sent it to V2V Global Partnership. Okay. Uh, email? No, as a, through the chat. You said through the chat. So I've sent yes, it to yes. You. Okay. Can you unshare now your screen so we can share it for you? And then you can say next slide and then we'll uh, okay. proceed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for that. You know, sorry. No, no problem. Not sure what happened. Mm, yeah. I think we're ready. Can you see the slides now? Cafe? Yes, I can see the slides. Okay, you can uh, you can start now. Okay. And you need to start your video as well. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, Please. so good morning, everyone. This is Cafe Fakoya. Um, my presentation is on shell fisheries as a tool for conservation of mangroves. And um, next slide, please. So I, this, I, this topic, I hope, will give some response from the conservation communities and also from governments because it has to do with gender. Um, uh, I'll just go through, uh, briefly through the CB camps of mangroves. Now, despite covering about 3 to 5% of total global forest area, mangroves are very important in terms of, of provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services. The mangrove ecosystems services provide or contribute to 13% of these sustainable development goals, but recent studies have only documented three of these so SDGs as being implemented locally. Now, mangroves have traditionally supplied indigenous coastal communities with uh, fertile fishing grounds on fishes, wood for construction, firewood, on it, fibers, dyes, tanning, and medicines, and so many more. Um, I'm sure that a lot of local studies that have documented the so many products that are derived from the mangroves ecosystems. I would like to pinpoint on just a few of the major um, or important key functions or ecosystem services. I would like to start with climate mitigation and adaptation. In climate mitigation, the storage capacity of mangroves is about 6.4 billion tons, and which is twice to four times the global rate observed in terrestrial forests. And the mitigation, but the mitigation capacity of kelps, algae, and soft muddy, uh, muddy benthic habitats are known and cannot be used in terms of the viability in climate mitigation. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, more or less a, uh, an illustration of the ecosystem services. There are so many that, and uh, but these are just the major ones that are normally quoted from provisioning like wood from fisheries, uh, providing livelihoods for the coastal populations, uh, coastal protection from storm, water filtration, tourism, and so many others. Next slide, please. Uh, the mangroves are especially very important because in large countries like Nigeria, Colombia, and Bangladesh, they are able to store the equivalent of more than 1% of national fossil fuel emissions. And as I said before, they are very important as fish factories. They produce fish, and they're also um, essential fish habitats. That is their important nursery grounds or habitat for so many fishes, both that both fishes uh, fishes that are fished commercially offshore, and as well as uh, fishes that are fished within the mangroves or adjacent to the mangroves. The importance cannot be overstressed. For instance, in Australia, mangroves ecosystem support commercial fisheries to the tune of 3.5 million Australian dollars per year, and of course the 
near, the near shore fisheries or coastal fisheries within the mangroves and also adjacent to the mangroves are typically subsistent at the scene on a small scale. And these more or less provide the coastal fishing communities with their needs in terms of uh, uh, fish as food, income and other, and other materials or raw materials that they require in terms of wood for fuel, for fuel and other things. Now, as coastal defenders, the, the mangroves play a very important role in erosion control, flood prevention, and storm protection. In addition, they also provide important cultural services that are more or less linked to the traditions or customs of communities. And, in, and these also include uh, heritage, amenity, apart from the spiritual aspect and existence values. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, then, but then the issue is that um, mangroves, as they have, uh, they are very important, but their importance is just being acknowledged worldwide. There are efforts all over the world to conserve and um, manage uh, the uh, mangrove resources to prevent further degradation of the mangrove resources. And these efforts do not in in include conservation efforts or preservation of the of the remaining mangrove stands, but it also includes restoration efforts. Now, uh, but then in order to actually implement strategic conservation and management um, effort, there needs to be data. Uh, but then um, but historically, conservation has neglected ecosystem services and data are very, very re rarely included in conservation plans. That has been a dilemma. Now, uh, Baseline information on mangroves in Africa that are needed for uh, environmental impact assessments and management are either too old, unavailable, or inadequate. Uh, mangroves especially have inadequate fisheries data because most of them tend to be inaccessible. And uh, this makes it difficult to measure and evaluate the economic and social value of mangrove assisted fisheries. And of course, in addition to this, um, it's also risk ex excluding the evaluation, the socioeconomic evaluation of other users of mangroves. And now, except for the works of very, very few, there's little quantitative data that exists on mangrove use, livelihood dependencies, and the relationship between mangrove fisheries and human well-being. Next slide, please. Um, there is, however, fraction in valuation of ecosystem of ecosystem services in mangrove, uh, in mangrove, in mangroves and other wetland environment. And the goal, of course, is to support the livelihoods of the impoverished people that depend on them. Preserving mangroves requires quantitative and experimental investigations to back them up, especially where fisheries are exploited. Although the what we know as academic ecological knowledge or Western scientific knowledge are advancing or have shown um, considerable advancement in terms of the findings, however, however, they are not being if they have not been able to filling all the gaps in the knowledge. Next slide, please. So um, for developing countries, Western scientific knowledge or AEK can be very costly to implement and therefore a new novel, a new approach must be sought. And now the ideal thing would be to, you know, to include engagement of mangrove users, particularly for subsistence, for particularly for those that uh, um, depend on the mangroves for subsistence into uh, sustainable use conservation and management institutions effectively. effectively. It is therefore apparent that there's a missing link and that missing link is the absence of social elements of mangrove use for fisheries that have not been considered in the management of the resources. And therefore this has not helped with the prioritization of slowing down mangrove decline, restoration and climate mitigation. However, local ecological knowledge, LEK of, offers a complementary knowledge system to AEK. It cannot be subsumed or fully integrated by, into AEK, but it can help fill in the gap where AEK is weak or as is highly inadequate. Next slide, please. Uh, to shed much more in, uh, picture on the importance of LEK, several international in, in agreements and several global instruments I've also advocated for the protection of the indigenous rights and traditional ecological knowledge within conservation. 
Now, um, including the Ramsar website, the, Ram the Ramsar site, the, you also have United Nations uh, Convention of, of Biological Diversity. You have the United Nations Environmental Protection Convention of, 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 Bi of, Bi of Biological Diversity, and so many other you know, uh, global instruments have in included the protection or relates to the use of indigenous traditional or, or local ecological knowledge in their frameworks. For too long, it is acknowledged that the traditional practices and, not, and local knowledge have been overlooked, but now they are gaining recognition for their importance and for sustaining the communities that hold this power or knowledge. And uh, more especially is over, uh, overlooked are the importance of women green activities for, bio, for biodiversity conservation and for the conservation of critical fish or critical or essential fish habitat linked to fisheries productivity. LEK holds the potential to make contributions when AEK is weak. However, in as much as there are some studies we can actually lay our hands on on LEK, uh, most of them, however, are not inclusive. That is, they do not include LEK in the studies. Inclusion of LEK means that from the point of um, this uh, project or project design or research design to the point of implementation, you have the uh, community users or the mangrove users involved in the whole project. This is different from when you learn from L in LEK or when you learn about LEK, which form more or less the uh, predominant number of studies in, in LEK. Next slide, please. Now, um, this is on mangrove protection and conservation, just to, for us to understand the status of mangrove protection and conservation. It is well understood that mangroves are among the most threatened tropical ecosystems. Over a 24 year period, there has been a gradual loss of mangroves worldwide and also in Africa. Uh, the loss for Africa was reported to be 152.2 kilometers squared. This is about 2.5. 2.15% over that for 24 year period. However, the greatest mangrove protection is in the Americas. You have uh, the South and North Americas, Oceania, Asia, and lastly, Africa. The current global system of protected areas covers about 13.5% of mangrove distribution and up to 42% if um, IUCN sites and other, and other sites that have not been um, classified are included. Now, many it's very very significant also to know that many high priority areas are not currently protected, and in Africa, less than two percent of high priority areas are under protection. The high priority areas are areas that uh, need that uh, require uh, maximum um, maximum uh, benefit of of the presence of mangroves. However, this Areas are also areas of high population density. There are areas that are in vicinity of valuable industries like the oil industry. There are also uh, areas that are in vicinity of rich agricultural land and productive fishing grounds. So there is a, there tends to be an avoidance of these areas that are high priority areas and that could benefit most from a pro the mangrove protection. But because of uh, economic and political interests, these areas or high priority areas are really protected. So what you have more or less is like the, you have a loss and the, the loss and declining condition of mangroves have placed the livelihood of local communities and biodiversity at risk, as well as contributed to climate change. Because mangroves are what you call blue carbons and they have the capacity to store carbon is much more higher than what we can get from the tropical forest ecosystems. So when you decimate mangroves, you're also reducing the mitigation capacity of the mangroves globally. Next slide, please. And now coming back home to West Africa and to Nigeria. The West African mangroves are found discontinuously from Senegal to the Niger Delta. The Niger Delta is in Nigeria. And this represents about 15% of the world mangrove cover, totaling some 15,000 kilometers squared. In West Africa, the coastal communities that line the mangroves, uh, the coastlines and the mangroves, rely heavily on mangroves for 
food security, poverty elevation, and income. Mangrove dependent uh, fisheries in the West African region um, produces about 39% of captured fish. The Nigeria's mangrove forest is at nearly 35% of the total cover for West Africa. It is the largest in Africa and the third largest in the world. Nigeria's rich soil carbon places it third in global rankings and the, it has the highest total mangrove biomass and carbon within West Africa. So to, this means that Nigeria has the highest uh, storage capacity of carbon in, within West Africa and also within Africa. Next slide, please. So this is a map of Nigeria showing the, um, here along the coastline, the southern part, you can see the, the extent of the mangroves from Lagos in the, in the west to, uh, to Cross River in the east. Next slide, please. Now, the, the most expansive area of um, mangroves is found in the Niger Delta. And ironically, Niger Delta is an oil-rich area with poor people who subsist mainly on fishing and farming. According to Omogwe et al, 2021, yeah, there are about 40,000 estuarian and mangrove ecosystem-based shellfish harvesters along Nigeria's mangrove coast, which support about 400,000 household dependents. However, um, this study was conducted not in all the um, 10 coastal states, and therefore the, uh, this, I think, should be a safe or conservative est estimate of the, of the total number of shellfish harvesters and their dependents. The shellfish, uh, shellfish ecosystem enhance, uh, enhance, uh, enhances uh, the ecosystem and improves gender equality and equity. The shellfishes earn the mangrove the reputation as supermarkets of the poor and are largely underreported in many cases because they are used for subsistence, used to feeding the households of the harvesters and they therefore do not or are not uh, documented in the official records of fisheries data. And of course, unless they are items of export, the, the catch or the landings are rarely reported. Uh, in addition, um, some of the shell fisheries like the mangrove oyster is very crucial to global ocean health and is and for monitoring of health of mangroves. It also helps to filter and clean water and also reduces bank erosion. So these are some of the important aspects of mangroves that occur in global, uh, around the globe and also in West Africa. Next slide, please. These are some of the harvested Nigerian mangroves. This was uh, captured by Omegbe Meto during the participatory um, research in West Africa. Next slide, please. Uh, mangrove, laws and, mangrove laws and consequences. Um, there are few directed mar directly marketed goods that are visible. And of course, when you uh, take out the shellfish trees, when you take out the wood, the um, the awning, the fuel wood, you, the other uses, the other importance of or ecosystem services provided by mangroves are not seen and therefore are not easily quantified. And this leads to low perceptions of those ecosystems, including the regulating, supporting, and cultural services. Now, uh, what, I, what are actually leading to the rapid loss of mangroves or have been leading to the rapid loss of mangroves uh, is rapid urbanization, the coastal development and, com and conversion of the mangroves for shrimp farming and, and agriculture. Now, these are taking over many areas of mangroves along the, um, uh, principally in those areas that are also urbanized or very close to the cities. You see that people move towards the coastline and in moving towards the coastline, they clear mangroves and other vital wetland systems. Also, uh, according for the mangrove laws and low, and low, and low perception of the, of the um, importance of mangroves is the religion and modernization because these are railroaded social values of mangroves in the Niger Delta. Uh, religion uh, is is not really helping matters at times when it's more or less in conflict with traditional values and the traditional beliefs held by the locals with respect to the um, 
mangrove ecosystem because some of the mangroves are totems for some of the communities and with modernization and region they trying to dis the, these things are these beliefs are easily dispelled as being evil as being as not being clean and then there's, there's also the significance of shellfish and women's gleaning for nutritional needs of household is under is often underscored by the lack of fishery protection resulting in depleting local fish supplies. And of course, we cannot rule out the indirect pressures of natural processes, which are over uh, exacerbated by human actions or anthropogenic activities. We have natural processes that may occur like storms and the likes, but then these have been exac exacerbated as a result by human actions or anthropogenic activities such that the severity of or the occurrence of these um, natural processes are much more and could also damage or destroy the mangroves. Next slide, please. Uh, this is also a picture of some of the drivers of mangrove loss, which I've explained earlier, conversion of mangroves to agricultural field, stream farming, logging, um, pollution is also part of it. The, the discharge of effluent into the water body, coastal development, urbanization, the, all these constitute threats to the mangrove ecosystem. Next slide, please. Our further losses are occur as a result of selective harvesting of mangroves for firewood, for building and traps. This can actually change the forest structure and ecological processes. Now, and then when uh, oysters are being collected, some of the um, practices of collecting oysters are also destructive and also you know, increase the mangrove loss. And of course, we cannot rule out the action of free riders who do not have any respect for local rules and therefore they, are, they, break, the social, they break the social bonding and of course, a result into unsustainable harvesting of mangroves. So the drastic decline in mangrove cover in combination with all those factors like climate change, pollution, ocean acidification, presents significant threat to shell fisheries and other, and including the oyster fishery, which is very, very uh, important in so many areas along the West African coast. Furthermore, um, also constituting to mangrove laws is when there's erosion of LEK as a result of changes in policy or when there are relocations of um, of local mangrove users from the vicinity of mangroves to other places or because of shifting or livelihoods. Once there's a disconnection, there's also a loss in the LEK and this also continues to erode, you know, causes the, um, the devaluation of the, of the mangroves in terms of the pers perspective people will continue to hold. Next, next slide, please. Um, what is the state of mangrove management and conservation? Now, where ownership of mangrove has been formalized, the management decisions could be taken from the local users and given to non-local users, such as governments and NGOs. And these will now, and these agencies of different bodies will now be in charge of, you know, um, formulating and implementing. Um, policies or management and conservation strategies that may not be or that may not be aligned with the needs or with the perspectives of the local users. So, and in many African countries are uh, signatories to inter in international uh, doc uh, instruments that are related to mangrove um, conventions and uh, many of our uh, established national action of action, action plans, uh, plans for inclusion of mangroves in protected areas but still, all these are still are still not protecting the mangroves enough. In fact, Nigeria has a plethora of environmental laws, regulations, and international policies that, although aimed at mangroves, are not really protecting the mangroves as they should. Because there are other factors that are accrued to this. In Nigeria, for instance, there are no uh, regulations for the management of shell fisheries and mangroves, and then. Though we have a coastal um, ecosystem with shell fisheries, but we deal in Ramsar site, but this is largely a freshwater wetland. Next slide, please. So even we have mangrove forest reserves and national parks, but these have been ineffective in combating mangrove loss. 
and then to um to look at it from the um government point of view there's no single body that is in charge or responsible for ensuring proper conservation and protection of mangroves and they though there may be so many institutions that involve in mangrove related strategies or conservation effort but they tend to overlap and there's no clear collaborative platform to all these different bodies together and then and then to top it or to top it or, or in 2023 nigeria left out social engagement which includes inclusiveness and participation of the local of the local uh, mangrove users it also left a recognition of indigenous people and local communities and local governance capacity building but it also reduced measures related to climate resilience fisheries and aquaculture in its nationally de determined contributions. Next slide, please. So when it, it went, well, the exclusion of um, the, the exclusion of the local uh, the local mangrove users means a lot. It means that there is no place for LEK in helping to develop management and conservative and conservation strategies of mangroves in the country. Now, what can we learn from women dominated shell fisheries in the mangroves? Um, the voluntary guideline for small scale fisheries acknowledging, acknowledges the importance of aquatic ecosystems and biodiversity in marine and inland fishing communities, livelihoods, and well being. There's a connection between the well being of the aquatic ecosystems and the community well being. Now, shell fisheries provide the links to link local ecolog ecological knowledge to scientific concerned with mangrove laws, rising sea levels, and oceans acidification. The highly integrated uh, shell fisheries value chains increase the opportunity for women's empowerment in the management of the fisheries. Most of the shell fisheries that are uh, associated with mangroves are highly vertically integrated, meaning that from the harvesting node to the marketing node, distribution node, you have many women participating in, along each node. So, and this help, helps to increase the opportunity for women to be involved in the management of the resources. And because it intends to increase the stake of sustainability within this sector, and eventually it has that incentivizing um, aspect to change social behavior for sustainable resources of demand of the sustainable resources management. Next slide, please. There are some um, ways by which these some of uh, by which uh, mangroves are, and oysters, because concomitantly mangroves and oysters occur together and other shell fisheries. So there are some ways by which um, some effort or control are being exerted to manage these resources. Now these include license, use of license, catch quotas, levies of fees on oysters, and fines. Fines are often I mean, used to deter people from unsustainable harvest, and these have been implemented in some of the fisheries. We also have customary closed days, or closed season and closed areas for harvesting shell fishes and mangroves. Now, there are two um, women's organizations I'd like to point out. One is the Tri Oysters Women's Association in the Gambia, and the other is the Densu Oyster Pickers Association in Ghana. These have oyster fishery management plan that include community managed exclusive use zones for oyster harvesting. The implication is that where you have um, a management plan for oysters, it means that there is also some protection for the mangroves. So both women groups are also involved in mangrove reforestation programs and have a closed harvesting season. So this helps to preserve the mangroves. And then they also um, conduct environmentally safe, um, environmentally friendly harvesting practices by harvesting the, the roots of the mangroves to make the suspended oysters fall or by the tripping. And this they do over cutting the roots. By the tripping means that they pick the oysters from the, uh, from the mangroves rather than cutting the mangroves and then constituting loss, further loss to the mangroves. Next slide, please. Now, women's ecological knowledge offers opportunity to inform management and conservation 
of ecological and social context of mangroves at um, local, national, regional, and global scales. It is also important to note that not all users, by virtue, by virtue of the fact that they are women or females, can assume to have the same level of local ecological knowledge, which is necessary to manage and to manage the ecosystem and its resources reasonably. Now, this is a fact. Um, we cannot assume that all women are homogeneous. They are heterogeneous because they are bound to belong to diff to belong to diff um, different maybe different villages or have different cultural identities, or they are bound to have different socioeconomic profiles. So this doesn't make women homogeneous, but they, they are heterogeneous. And some have more knowledge of the traditional ecological knowledge of mangroves than others. So all this needs to be in perspective so that when there's a plan to involve early care, there should be efforts to understand the different, uh, to understand the different resource users, the experiences and the knowledge regarding to the local environment. It is also important to put in place a gender sensitive approach to the value chain to ensure that the economy, economic opportunity of women is not lost or reduced by men rushing in into the value chain because it has suddenly become profitable. Then there's also that aspect that I, I hope will also you know, uh, get to the other African countries, starting from the, uh, from the Gambia, where they started with the Tri Oysters Women's Association. They've, they also tried to do some peer-to-peer -peer learning to other West African countries. And I know that they've actually been to Ghana and other and some other countries, and gradually I hope that what they have started will also take uh, will also take shape and you know, be replicated in other African countries besides just Ghana and the Gambia. Next slide, please. In conclusions, I would like to say that there's a link between human well-being and ecosystem health, and this has been you know um, highlighted in various legislations, particularly for coastal communities and their fisheries. Mangrove ecosystems are carbon stores, they are fish factories, they are coastal defendants, and they are all of immense cultural value or significance. The mangrove associated shore fisheries are classic examples of sustainable climate smart or resilient fisheries and improved gender equity. The overlook, there's an overlooked interdependency between shore fisheries, mangroves, coupled with human component. The awareness of mangroves as a coupled natural human system is bringing attention to TK and its holders. Conservation based on female knowledge-based system is a low hanging food. Next slide, please. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. You know, that's that's a very detailed uh, you know, you know uh, presentation of not only the global overview of mangroves and its status, but also uh, what is happening in the um, in the specific context of Senegal and uh, and Nigeria, and, um, which holds almost you know as you say fifteen percent of the global uh, mangroves and the third largest mangrove uh, reserve uh, in the world. You know which is uh, which is you know, so important uh, in terms of not only biodiversity, but also from a local livelihoods, uh, you know, uh, perspective. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so we will now go uh, to the um, questions. Uh, and um, uh, those who are watching on YouTube, please uh, send your questions through the uh, chat function. And we'll read it out to Dr. Uh, Farpaya. But uh, just to start off uh, some discussion, uh, if I may just ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the gender sensitive approach uh, to, uh, uh, you know, so selfish uh, uh, value chain that you mentioned. Can you just elaborate a little bit? Because I know a lot of people are listening on uh, uh, through v YouTube who work on, you know, gender in fisheries and, you know, and so they might benefit a little more if you can outline the approach that uh, that you just talked about briefly. Okay, thank you. 
Now, a gender sensitive approach is um, recommended because there are situations, even in fisheries, whereby once a value chain is has been promoted, has been improved, it tends to attract more interest. And the interest, of course, will come from the opposite gender, the men. And then you find them coming in and then taking over the spaces of the women, at least nudging them out because they have uh, they are more empowered and they have better maybe resources. So a gender sensitive approach would help to you know, women to sustain their economic standings such that they will not be easily edged out by the men. So there must be policies in place to help uplift the women, help them um, access maybe more um, finance or credit when necessary, and then help them to acquire other resources that may be useful for them. And of course, it is a women-dominated dominated fisheries, but it is not impossible for you know, that um, fishery to be overtaken by outsiders or by you know, by the male gender, if the women are found not to be empowered or to withstand the rigors of that value chain. So there must be developmental efforts geared towards the women to ensure that the women are capable of standing on their own and that they will be able to withstand, you know, any, uh, they'll be more resilient and they'll be able to withstand any difficulties and sustain their positions. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, that, in many ways, leads to stewardship uh, in uh, you know mangrove selfish uh, you know. Yes, I, 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 I just thought of that. Um, you know, when you look at the mangroves, the first point of call you look, you think about the mangroves like is the shell fisheries that come from the mangrove, the food essentially. And of course, we know that many of the coastal communities with mangroves rely heavily on the mangroves for food, and for mainly for subsist for subsistence for subsistence to feed their households. Now, that should be a strategic entry point for conservation and management because the those people exploiting the, the mangroves for food would essentially want the mangroves to continue to be there to provide the food for them. So through that way, you can actually establish stewardship in those who see it as of primary importance for their survival. And that is why I am advocating that women should be empowered to you know to lead the conservation and management efforts to preserve the mangroves and also to restore the mangroves. There's a difference between conservation, preserving mm -hmm. what is there, and restoration. Even restoration in so many places do not always come out successful. And it is uh, some studies have indicated that uh, the original mangrove stands are often better in terms of productivity than the restored mangroves, so or replanted mangroves. So it is, and of course we have examples that are thriving, uh, particularly the Gambia, the Tri Oyster Women's Association in Gambia. They are a very good example of women having exclusive rights to mangroves areas where the oysters thrive and, and for them to be, and then they are also known to be able to manage the resources, you know, in a very good, in a very sustainable manner. So, and then we also have the Densu Oyster Pickers Association in Ghana, they also have a management plan and they have also have exclusive rights to some areas of mangroves for their oyster harvesting. So those two examples are models that can be replicated along, I mean, in other countries in West Africa, principally in Nigeria, where there's no formal law. Those two, those two associations have formal laws backing them. So they are formalized, they are constitutional. But in Nigeria, where we don't even have a plan for the shell fisheries, talk less of the mangroves. So I feel that such influence coming from other African countries that do not have the expanse of mangroves we have are very good models for us to build. Yes, we may have so many other complicating you know, problems in the oil industries, but I think that there, in some ways, something can be started in Nigeria to mm -hmm. have something like a model of what is obtainable in Ghana and in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that's, a, that's a very good insight, you know. Uh, where there is less and less mangroves, there is uh, more and more efforts to conserve and uh, create stewardship of local communities. But in contrast, you know, where there is a lot of mangroves like Nigeria, uh, you know, there is a lack of, you know, regulation and lack of, you know, efforts to conserve them, you know. And uh, this is almost like a model, you know, we, you know, and the same trends we see in other parts of the world as well. So we'll now move on to some questions that I see are here. The first one is not a question, but a comment. Um, 
from Kimi uh, Ajolara. And Kimi is uh, saying thanks for uh, thanks so much for this presentation. Uh, mangroves are harvested in coastal areas of Nigeria as fuel, fuel wood for uh, spot collection of oyster mangroves. Uh, and this has uh, made mangrove to decline rapidly. So she's agreeing and she's just, you know, confirming with her own probably research that, you know, what you're saying is a fact uh, in, in Nigeria. The second one is a question from uh, Ruel Mia from Bangladesh, um, but Ruel is also, is, uh, also part of uh, Waterloo, uh, University of Waterloo. So thanks for excellent presentation. Uh, do women involved in involved in uh, uh, shell fisheries have any informal platform to share their concerns? Do the government consider provisions of SSF guidelines related to gender equity in in the study area you presented? Okay. Um. Yes, I believe the women have some platforms, informal platforms, like in Nigeria, a lot of um. Women in the small scale fishery sector are also organized into associations. But then I, I remember that I made some inquiries and some time ago, but then there are more platforms for women involved in fin fisheries value chains and in shell fisheries value chains. So that there's a there's a gap between you know, those uh, two areas, fin fisheries and shell fisheries. So but then but then in, in areas where they are more predominant towards this uh, eastern part of the Niger Delta. And Niger Delta and they, they are, I think there are more, there should be more of the informal groups, but I that what I can say is if they really have the voice, you know, to um to do self-advocacy, that is what I cannot really say. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the SSF guidelines, the SSF guidelines are to us, they're still fairly new instruments, even though they are about 10 years old. What I'm saying is that they're new is because. In nineteen in two thousand and twenty two, I and um, Professor Sheikh Akintola brought the um, organized the first uh, stakeholders workshop on the small scale fishery guidelines in Nigeria, and with in association with uh, the World Fish, with the FAO, with an ICSF. But then, of course, uh, there's also some limitation to what we could do with after staging the workshop. You know, so it's still fairly new. And of course, we couldn't invite everyone. We just had to. Uh, we had we had an handful of 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 fishers. We had you know it's, it's a multi stakeholder approach. So we had other people from other areas, the state actors, the other non state actors, the CSOs, the academia, research, the media. So it's it was a very interesting uh, um, workshop. But then they still. The, the level of awareness needs to be improved. There needs to be more effort. There needs to be more, um, how would I say? Because it was just a national workshop. I think we need to have more of those awareness workshop, you know, in different parts of the country. Now, just a big country with 36 states and different regions, different languages. So we need to take those, the, that type of awareness raising workshop on the SSF guidelines to other parts of the country. We need to create more awareness on to put more awareness via communication tools, you know, on on the SSF guidelines. So it the government is still, I think, trying to get up, up trying to get up to that, doing that. But it, there is not yet in full swing. So we still have a little more to go. Unlike Ghana, Ghana is in the forefront of Ghana is in forefront of the SSF guidelines, and so is Senegal. So, but we still need more push in Nigeria to make the make it more popular amongst the people who are the local end users, the shellfish harvesters and the fin fish harvesters. They need to be more involved. You need to be, have more awareness of the guidelines and what yeah. it holds for them. Yeah, yeah. And the importance of, you know, institution building at all levels, especially at the community level, at the, mm. the, 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 the level at which the, uh, the Nigerian women are involved in shellfish, you know, stewardship creation. So the importance of uh, institution building um, is, uh, you know, something that probably Ruel is asking in terms of, you know, its connection to the stewardship, you know, because institutions are, uh, you know, lifeline of, you know, how a stewardship process can be created because it constantly engages 
people in debating and negotiating and talking to each other and interacting and thereby not only resolve some of the issues and problems at their own level but also create a larger voice uh, you know uh, to 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 face the government and uh, other you know bigger um, mm. stakeholders you know so so the importance of that the second question is from alham mahamadi and alham is asking uh, thank you uh, so much for the interesting presentation. Can you provide some examples of the local knowledge uh, that can be learned from women? Uh, how do women currently engage in knowledge uh, co-creation? Well, thank you for that. As I said, as I said I made mention of LEK and how LEK is used in studies. You know, we can only get documentation of LEK when studies have been conducted and it uh, actually documents LEK. Now, fundamentally, LEK is being used, but the it is not used mostly as in including the end the mangrove users in research. That is on a very low proportion compared to using or learning about LEK or learning from LEK. You know, learning about LEK is like reading about what women do. That's just like the way I've just made the presentation. I'm telling you about LEK and the women's practices. Um, learning from LEK is like asking them from their perception. You're not really involving them in the research. But, le but including LEK is when the women are included in the research, when the mangrove users are included in the research from the inception, research design, to implementation. So it goes a long way. So in that is when you are actually including, you know, LEK, um, when you're including LEK in research. Well, fundamentally, there is a lower proportion of inclusion of LEK in research. So I can't say specifically where women have been, um, have been included in studies right from inception to the end. But it is all, it is very low compared to learning from LEK or learning about LEK. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting, uh, uh, Kafat, uh, because uh, what you're saying is just you know talking to women and learning about the local knowledge they have is not enough. You know, uh, mm -hmm. as a measure, what you are suggesting is when you involve from the you know first point to the last point of a you know project uh, and get all of those knowledge uh, that that is held by women and incorporate that uh, in into the uh, into the project conception as well as implementation and they themselves become a part of this entire process mm -hmm. then the uh, you know logical inclusion uh, of uh, local knowledge uh, happened so uh, must have happened so so that's a, that's a nice way of you know uh, creating an inclusive uh, approach uh, to how uh, we work with local uh, ecological knowledge, you know, not only women, but also you know, other kinds of local ecological knowledge held by other stakeholders. You know. So that's an interesting uh, you know, uh, you know, answer, uh, I must say. Um, uh, we don't have, uh, I don't see any questions here, but I have one or two uh, in, uh, in questions that I, if I may uh, just ask you. Um, one is about the coordination at the government level you talked about. So there is there are too many. You know, sometimes we find that you know there are not enough uh, that is being done at the government level. Sometimes we find that is that there is a uh, overkill in terms of you know too many departments, too many you know uh, agencies getting involved, and what they suffer from is a lack of coordination between mm -hmm. uh, them. Um, so, and you refer to that in your presentation that there are too many uh, departments, too many agencies who are involved in this particular delta, and uh, but the actions are not uh, coherent. You know, uh, so can you speak a little bit more to that intergovernment, uh, you know, uh, coordination, and uh, what does it signify for building uh, community, uh, you know, based uh, stewardship processes, especially in the context of mangroves. Okay, thank you. Now, um, uh, there are agencies, government agencies, and most of them um, are responsible for environmental laws, 
but those environmental laws may be broad and not specific to mangroves. So, and that is what the situation we have. We don't have um, mangrove specific uh, legislation or policy framework. Mm -hmm. So, but there are legislations or policies that are related to mangroves. Those are more general. Now you have agencies that may have overlapping functions. You can you have the, the Ministry of Environment, you can have also the Ministry of Forestry, you can have the Ministry of Fisheries. Remember that um, if mangroves are also is uh, provide essential fish habitats for fish for the fish. So and then of course mangroves because mangroves are often said to be mangrove forests, they can also be under the forestry uh, ministry or departments. And then because they're also part of the environment, they're also affected by whatever goes on the environment, maybe coastal development or pollution. They're also under the Ministry of Environment. So there are specific legislations or policies that all these agencies and many more perhaps, you know, may want to um, our heart on. And this shows, and at the end of the day, you find that they tend to have overlapping jurisdiction. There's no clear cut jurisdiction for each of them. And then there tends to be, there's no coordination. And where there's no coordination means that it's going to have an impact on institutional building of the mangrove users. You cannot institutionalize that because even at the governmental level, there's still a, a very big, big wide gap in terms of coordination. It's only when there's coordination and there's a, a clear cut policy on who should should be responsible for the mangroves. If there's a man, if there's a legislation specific to the for the mangroves or the, for the shell fisheries, and if there's a body that is uh, specifically uh, specifically authorized to, to build authority of, of over the mangroves and shell fisheries, we may continue to have that problems of prioritizing who should be there or who should not because there will be power puzzle. Or power, the power pause or power play. So yeah. this would not all go well for the local communities because there will be conflicting signals coming from all these different agencies at times. So as long as they, they can coordinate the activities, they, there's going to be conflicting agencies and of course signals going to the mangrove um, mangrove communities. Yeah. So it wouldn't really help the situation. Yeah, and the legislation becomes essential. Uh because it, it 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 either creates a nodal agency to manage the mangroves or creates uh, the playing field for coordination mm -hmm. between the departments. You know? yes. So in either way, you know, a legislation becomes a fundamental uh, need uh, in the case study area that you were talking about. So we have one more question uh, from KM Sahariar uh, Nazrul Rimon. And uh, Sahariar is asking, uh, saying thanks uh, for your informative presentation. Dr. Kafayat, probably I missed the information, uh, but I am wondering how you have found gender conflicts in mangrove stewardship. Are there any gender conflicts? If so, you know, how do you, uh, okay. you know, what's your experience? Yes, yes, there could be gender conflicts. For instance, in, I'll make, uh, I'll make example of what I reviewed, and uh, specifically in the Senegambia Gambia area, where you have the tri oyster women, and then there were also efforts to bring in other women, you know, from other ethnic groups. And there were conflicts because they had different value systems and different ways of um, harvesting the mangroves, you know. So there could be conflicts when people have different identities and they have different value systems and they hold different um, local ecological knowledge. There's an extent to which one group has, and there's an extent to which another group has. So there could be conflicts within the women group. That is also gender conflict, because there are people of that of heterogeneous identity, not of homogeneous identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't see any more questions, but we are also inching towards uh, the time. Uh, we have uh, less than five minutes left. Uh, in that time, if I may just ask one uh, particular question uh, uh, and then we'll bring it to an end. My question is with regard to um, 
the transboundary nature of mangroves. In many parts of the world, mangroves stretch out of one uh, territory uh, and goes into the other. So you talked about the, uh, the Niger Delta, which is between Senegal and Nigeria. Um, you may already uh, probably know that, you know, B2B is very actively working um, in the Sundarbans uh, mangrove uh, uh, reserve, uh, where uh, Bangladesh and India, you know, share uh, portions of the mangrove itself. You know, there are many other similar examples. So if we can uh, hear a little bit more about your perspectives on what kind of added complexities it brings when mangroves, which are so critical for not only conservation and biodiversity, but also very critical for local livelihoods and uh, identity and lives and other things, uh, stretch out of uh, one territory to the other. Because, you know, one way we always assume is that, you know, when you know it is transboundary, then the problems that we talk about often gets, uh, you know, doubly or triply, you know, you know, complicated, you know, there's more complications because it is now between two countries and all. So if you can, uh, you know, provide some perspectives on uh, the transboundary nature of uh, mangroves and uh, what are some of your experience and uh, some of, uh, you know, the interventions that may be possible to make conservation and stewardship possible in those transboundary uh, mangroves. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, firstly, Niger Delta is within Nigeria, but you know uh, the the mangrove stretch from Senegal, maybe like in continuous band. But then who knows? Maybe the, some areas have have demarcations have have you know, suffered mangrove loss and are not just there. But then the Niger Delta has the largest expanse of mangrove in Nigeria. So, but then where you have um, transboundary issues, and that is also you know something that is also uh, apparent in fisheries. And I think in the same way that fisheries are also being um, governed, where you have transboundary issues, you have um, a regional, maybe a regional um, commission or uh, a two country a bilateral agreement, you know, to actually look at the um, look at the resources and the best way to manage those resources is very important uh, because uh, uh, these countries were. Create, I mean, the countries have, have been created. You know, Africa used to be maybe more homogeneous or much more homogeneous than what we have as countries then now, because these are the countries in Africa are the legacy of the colonial period. So yeah. now that we have countries like we have um, Cameroon bordering Cross River, and which and Cameroon also has its own expanse of mangroves. So, but when the when that resource is a trans becomes a transboundary issue, then there should be a bilateral agreement between the two countries to manage the resources effectively. Now, a very good example of where you know the the, the Gambia is actually leading management and conservation efforts of the mangrove is by um, by peer learning, peer to peer learning exchange with other African countries. From Ghana, they proceed. I mean, from the Gambia, they proceeded to Ghana. And from Ghana, they proceeded to Togo and, and other countries. So this shows that it is possible that there could also be peer-to-peer -peer learning exchange. And that could end. And because we are talking about the, the people at the local level, the mangrove local level. So there is also need to ensure that uh, the, the mangrove users, you know, sharing this, those resources have access to each other and have the ability to exchange knowledge and practices as in a way to encourage stewardship. From the one from the country that has a better management regime, you know that effect could trickle down or incentivize social behavioral change in the other country that has less of control or management of, of its resources. So I think a bilateral agreement followed by peer to peer learning would mm -hmm. actually help to move, you know, or to advance the management and conservation of the mangrove resources better. Yeah, and the, and the importance of not only government to government connection, but also from the stewards to stewards connection or user to user connection. Yes, uh, yes. that you you know mentioned. Yeah, that's that's great and a great note to bring uh, uh, the talk today uh, to an end. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Fakoya. 
And, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of learning that has happened because of your talk and the details that you provided. Of course, this kind of, you know, discussions and interactions doesn't end with a talk, you know, so we intend to continue this discussion uh, into the future as well, you know, not only through the work of V2V Global Partnership, but also, you know, uh, on uh, discussion on other forums, you know. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate your uh, contributions uh, today. Uh, and also uh, many thanks to our uh, global audience who joined uh, on YouTube and your patients, uh, you know, when we navigate, we're trying to navigate through the problem, uh, technical problem and uh, the wonderful questions you asked and, uh, you know, really contributed to this discussion on, uh, you know, mangrove cell fisheries and uh, stewardship opportunities for, especially for women in uh, uh, Nigeria and also uh, from a global perspective. So thank you very much. Join us you know, next month on the 26th of April, which is the last Friday of uh, uh, April uh, for yet another uh, you know, uh, edition of our thematic webinar. Uh, so see you all uh, there. Thank you. Thank